in the garden where he prayed straight to Pilate's heart in his perfect innocence took the blame for all and with ten thousand reasons why it didn't have to be in mercy, love and mercy, he thought of me. everybody. If you will, open your Bibles to Romans 8 and verse 11. Thank you for that, Jeannie. I thought there was going to be another verse, and I was like, oh, I'm not ready. <laughs> Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. Would you stand in honor of God's Word? But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Father, I pray that this morning you give me the words to say and all of us, Lord God, the heart to hear what you'd have to say to us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. The, pro the predominant theme of this chapter in the Word of God, Romans chapter 8, is the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Now, you and I are born-again Christians. If you're here this morning and you haven't trusted Jesus, I pray that you'll do that. But for the most part, those of us here this morning have accepted Jesus as our Savior, and so the Spirit of God is active in our lives. The minute you accept Jesus, the fullness of the Holy Spirit comes in to our lives. This verse talks about the resurrection power of the Holy Spirit. Someday we will be raised from the dead as Jesus was. But here's what I want to talk about also this morning. Even now we are resurrected to new life in our ongoing victorious life in this world. In other words, the Christian faith is about the resurrection of the Christian on two levels. Of course, someday... There is going to be a trumpet call from God. Someday we are going to go be with Him forever. Someday you and I will be given a resurrection bodies different from but identifiable with the bodies that we have now. But right now you are already raised with Him to newness of life. When I baptize someone in this baptistry, we always announce the fact that they are buried with Christ in believer's baptism and raised to newness of life. This verse, this passage in God's Word talks about both of those, I believe, together. And it says that the Holy Spirit raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Do you, do you understand the implications of that? Jesus rose from the grave. The Father raised Him from the grave and the Holy Spirit raised Him in the fullness of the Trinity, Jesus has come out of that grave. T.B. Maston in his book, Why Live the Christian Life, I think I referenced it last week as well. I haven't just now read it. It just so happened. But he said, we know that the final word belongs to our God. The clearest evidence of this fact is the empty tomb. It speaks the word of victory over all the forces that oppose the purposes of God. The reality is, if you and I really believe that Jesus is raised from the dead, 
that there is no place in all the Middle East, no hidden spot in Jerusalem or anything like that where you could find the bones of Jesus because he rose from the grave and ascended the right hand of God the Father. If we really believe that, and I know we believe that, then why can we not believe that he has the power through his resurrection to allow us to do anything that he's called us to do? He who raised him from the dead, he who came out of the grave, can do anything and will do anything and that in itself is what the devil ought to think about and does think about in my class this morning we talked about the fact that if you resist the devil he must flee from you you want to know why he must flee from you because he knows that he's licked at the resurrection of jesus when he came out of the grave the devil knew that death had been defeated he had been defeated and his days were numbered they had this week, and we hear this story from time to time. And I'm not sure uh, what the final end of it was, but there was a fellow in Texas who was awaiting execution for a gruesome murder. Of course, he says he didn't do it, and they're trying to uh, lobby Governor Abbott of Texas to not, not let him be executed because they're just sure that he's innocent, and he probably may or may not be. I, the a jury of his peers said that he wasn't. But can you imagine what it would be like to be on death row, to think about it, to let it get up in your head? It'd be tough, wouldn't it? Let me tell you this morning that because of the resurrection of Jesus, the devil's on death row. He's waiting hell. He knows. All these thousands of years, he knows that it's inevitable. He knows that he can wreak all the habit and that got havoc that he can or wants to right now. But there's limitations on that because God won't let him do certain things. And he knows that ultimately his end is hell because at the resurrection of Jesus, victory was proclaimed for the people of God. And the opposite is true for us. Every one of us awaits, barring the rapture of Jesus before that time, every one of us awaits a day of physical death in this world. Someday that will happen to you. Unless Jesus comes back for his church first, which will happen to one generation of Christians, but unless he does that, you and I will see a day of physical death. But for the Christian, because of the resurrection of Jesus, there is no other death. Let that sink in. We have, because of what he did, eternal life. And the Bible says here, we are people in whom the Spirit of God dwells. In Ecuador, on every New Year's Day, they burn a straw man. They make little men out of straw. They gather straw, build little men, and they burn little men, little men, and they burn these straw uh, images of people. And, and it's a celebration in their mind that what they're doing is basically burning the old man. It's a New Year's Day tradition in which they're saying, man, what I was last year, I'm not going to be anymore. What I was last year is over and I'm starting all over. Kind of similar to how we make New Year's resolutions. You ever kept very many New Year's resolutions? I didn't think so. I've kept very few of those, you know, because really the, the most common one is the weight loss thing. Bad time to try to lose weight in the dead of winter. I'm depressed. I'm going to eat. Hallelujah. <laughs> But they're trying to do that. But the problem with it is you really can't free the old man by burning a pile of straw made to look like a person. You can't change your nature. But when you come to Jesus, then the old man is dead. The old man is really changed. And for the person who's really come to Jesus, in whom the Spirit of God dwells, it really is new. All real Christians have the Spirit of God in their lives which is synonymous with having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Go back just a little bit to verse 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The New Testament uses the, the idea of the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ totally interchangeably due to the fact of the Trinity of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The, one of the reasons we get so caught up in understanding the Trinity is we try to make too much distinction in the Trinity. It's God, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. He manifests Himself to us in different ways, although very really different ways. But it says here that if the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Christ is in your heart and life and you have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, things really are different. We have victory 
now over death and sin, and we ought to live like it. Again, someday, every one of us who knows Jesus, even if we experience physical death in this world, there's going to be a great getting up day morning. Amen? There's going to be a day when we are going to be given, again, a physical body, identifiable with our old physical body, but glorified. And you say, preacher, explain more of that about, to me, about that to me. And I would if I could, and I can't, because the Bible doesn't give us enormous detail about that. So I'm not going to guess where the Bible's silent. But it just states the fact that we're going to have a resurrection, glorified body, but it will still be us. Now, that's a wonderful thought. That days are coming, but again, right now, understand that even though you are in this physical body, and frankly, when you come to Jesus, your physical body probably doesn't change much. You might get rid of some habits that will make your physical body in better shape. Amen? You, you might, there, if you're a drug addict before you come to Jesus and you repent of that, that's going to have good implications on your physical body. Amen? And a hundred other things might be true, but your physical body is the same. The day you get up after you get saved, people still recognize you. At Walmart, they say, Hi, Bob. <laughs> If your name's Bob here this morning, I'm not picking on you. I don't even know if anybody named Bob here this morning at all or not. They're going to know who you are. And someday we're going to have a resurrection body. But the day you trust Jesus, you are fundamentally a different person. You are already resurrected with Him. It, just as the devil has a done deal that he's going to hell, it's a done deal that we aren't going to be stuck with this physical body forever. I, well, I won't go there. But <laughs> that, that's always bad when the preacher says, I won't go there. And you're like, <laughs> where might that be? I'll tell you some other time. But the reality is, this old physical body doesn't get any better, does it? It just doesn't. But someday, we're going to rise from the dead with him. And even now, we are resurrection people. We have the riches of relationship, and we ought to live like it. We ought to realize what it is that we have. There's a story about an impoverished old Scottish woman. And she had this son in the United States and she still lived in poverty despite the fact that everybody in this Scottish village knew that her son had made it in the United States. He'd done quite well financially, but she still lived in poverty and it became gossip in this little Scottish village. Why doesn't her son take care of her. Why doesn't her son do something about her poverty? He could. And finally someday someone asked her about it. They said, well, why, why doesn't your son do something more about this? He, probably he seemed like such a good young man. We don't understand. She says, well, he doesn't help me, but he always sends me letters with all these little pretty pictures on them. It turned out those were bank notes. He'd been sending his mama money for years, but she didn't know what U.S. currency was. That's hard to imagine that, but in this, this is supposedly a true story. She didn't understand what she had, but she kept it all because her son sent it to her, and she realized suddenly that she was very, very wealthy to be in that little Scottish village. I believe a lot of Christians are in exactly the same position. We do not realize the riches of the glory of God in us. We do not realize the wealth of the Holy Spirit in each of our hearts. We do not realize the power we have over sin. We do not realize the responsibility we have for the lost. We are still thinking like an impoverished lost person even though we know we're going to heaven someday. We believe we're going to heaven someday. We believe God's promise and that's taken care of but we do not realize the wealth of resurrection power in us right now. Do you? Do you ever think of that? Do you ever think of the wealth that we have? And we ought to, instead of living and thinking too much like it was when we were in spiritual poverty, we ought to think about the wealth of Jesus in us. And he says, we will be resurrected by the Spirit that lives in us. Catch this verse. It says that the Spirit of God in Jesus, which in his case is a part of himself, the trinity of who he is, raised him from the dead. We talked about that at the beginning of this message. But that's the reality. The Spirit of God lives in your life. If you're a born-again Christian, the Holy Spirit has come in to your life. The Holy Spirit 
lives in our lives now, as we've been saying. But on that great didn't have day morning, when we rise from our graves with glorified bodies, it will be the Spirit of God in us that reanimates our bodies and lifts us up to resurrection life that we are already living now. Charles Haddon Spurgeon once said, My most comfortable prospect about this life is it will melt away into eternal life. See, here's part of our problem. We are not enough heavenly minded. Maybe when you were a Christian, someone said to you, my dad said to me when I got saved, he said, son, don't get so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Have you heard that saying? And Christians actually get concerned about that. Well, I, you know, I don't want to get too much pie in the sky, heaven stuff. No, why not? Why not? Why not think about heaven every day? Why not tap your feet every day? Why not get excited whenever this world becomes a rotten, nasty place as sometimes it does? Think about heaven. Focus on heaven. We got some guys out deer hunting today, okay. I'll probably go next weekend, but I'll be here Sunday. All right, I'll look. I'll look. But, you know, I go deer hunting. My son and I like to go deer hunting together. I'm not so much into hunting deer as I'm into my boy, and we have, we have a good time. I don't really care that much whether I kill a deer or not. I'd rather kill one. But let me tell you what one of the most wonderful things about deer hunting is, for those of you that don't deer hunt. You're out in cold weather. You're sitting under a tree, sitting still. One of the most wonderful thoughts in my mind during that time is when I go home, it will be warm there, and she will have probably cooked a delicious meal. I'm thinking about that the whole time. I'm thinking about, whoo, that's going to be great. <laughs> this world sometimes is an unpleasant place. Let it never be said for Christians to say, well, you know, when you come to Jesus, everything will just be great and fine. No, sometimes we go through cancer. Sometimes we go through back pain. Sometimes we go through financial reversals. Sometimes we Christians even go through broken relationships even if we did everything we knew to do. This is the real world. Uh, in case you are not aware, newsflash, you are living in this fallen world. Anybody not aware of that, please talk to me later and I'll get you some smelling salts, whatever you need. I don't know, I don't know what we'll do. I have a little talk with you. But we are going to see Jesus someday. We are going to a place where there's no more sorrow, neither crying, neither shall be there any more pain, for the former things have passed away. We are going to the place that is an indescribable glory of God and beauty. That is not a pie-in-the-sky hope of desperate people. It is the standard promise of the Bible. The resurrection body, Charles Hodge said, the resurrection body will be simply the ultimate outburst of a life that had been ripening for immortality under the cover of the old Adamic Adam's nature before. Right now, we're resurrection people, and we're in physical bodies. Sometimes things hurt. Sometimes in this world, things get better before it seems like they get worse. And frankly, sometimes if we live to a ripe old age, we think, yeah, ripe. <laughs> We're ripening great for eternity, and I'm ready to go. I've never talked to a Christian yet that I recall who was older and in pain and knew Jesus and was confident of their faith that was like, oh, but I'm so afraid to die, Brother Bill. I'm just so afraid to die. Why would you be? They're usually like, what's the hold up? You know? Amen? You and I have resurrection hope. So Paul says here, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Again, in a chapter where he's mainly talking about what the Holy Spirit's doing in your life right now, and he puts that in there as an important understanding of the necessary link between resurrection people now and the fact of resurrection then. Death is defeated. Jesus is risen. We ought to live like it and look forward. To heaven. Father, I thank you for the words that you've allowed to have from your word this morning. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here who has not accepted Jesus as Savior, this is a good time. Come forward, make a public profession of faith in Jesus. But for those of us who are Christians, oh God, help us to commit our lives and hearts to being resurrection people.
to lift our eyes up from the gaze of the world that is so desperately, powerfully wicked sometimes and hard and difficult and confusing and to lift our eyes up from the hills from whence cometh our help. For our help cometh from you, Lord, that made heaven and earth and saved us by grace through faith in Jesus. In your name I pray, amen.